The north of England is another country. It looks different, its people are different, and it feels different. Throughout the Middle Ages, the second biggest city in England after London was York. Of course, we know it was a Roman city, and the Saxons built an abbey there, and the Normans ravaged it, and then built a larger city and a larger abbey. And we know that the Archbishop of York is second only to Canterbury in the church. But come and look at York today. It's surely the most impressive cathedral city in Britain. Let's leave from the station, itself a cast iron cathedral. And there you see the silvery white medieval walls of York, topping a grass bank and originally with a moat below them. They circle the houses for two and a half miles and you can walk along the tops of the walls. But once through these walls and the city closes in on us, forget the roaring traffic, which shouldn't be there, and the lumpy new Yorkshire insurance building, which rivals the much-loved Minster in bulk, but not in beauty. We cross the ooze with its shipping and views of towers and spires of the little city churches, all of which are interesting, many with medieval stained glass and some with box pews. And let's turn right, past the Georgian assembly rooms. York is a real capital. When its wool trade and medieval guilds ceased to prosper, the county families came in and built themselves handsome 18th century town mansions with carved staircases and elaborate plasterwork. And let's go down Stonegate towards the Minster. This is old and narrow, like the shambles. And the tops of the houses nearly touch one another across the street. And there are Georgian shop fronts, nearly as good as those in the York Castle Museum, where two whole streets of old shops have been created. But here, in the city itself, from most streets, you can see one, two, or all three of the soaring cream-coloured towers of the Minster. The little dark brick houses, and particularly the old stone church of St. Michael le Belfry, make the Minster seem all the more enormous by contrast. It may not be the longest, but it is certainly the biggest cathedral in England. The twelve bells ring out from the southwest tower, and under their thunder we will go in at the west door. One's first impression is of length, vastness, and dim religious light. And then, as you get used to it, you realize the cause of this holy gloom. It is because Almost all the windows, 117 of them, are filled with medieval glass. With a pair of field glasses, one could spend weeks here studying the colored saints, angels, devils, and canopies in the glass alone. That's not counting the carved stone choir screen. For York is a city of stained glass. There was a long tradition of making it here from the 13th century and there's still a glass workshop in the shadow of the Minster. The Puritans never smashed York as they did other cathedrals. It suffered most damage from fire. The east window is the biggest area of medieval stained glass in the world. My favorite part of the Minster is the octagonal chapter house and the stone and glass entrance hall to it. Saxon Wittengamots Medieval chapter houses, modern committees. English people have always enjoyed conducting their business by discussion. Here, where the canons of York still discuss minster business, we are in a medieval dream of stained glass, wood and stone. As the bells ring down, one is filled with wonder at how it could have happened. How did a sturdy people from the windy moors and waterlogged plain of York create the nearest approach to heaven they could make on earth? Faith, emulation, pride in craftsmanship. Anyhow, there it is. And let's walk past all these windows and the stone tracery, down the north transept, round into the choir, and sit in one of the stalls. There was a song school founded here early in the seventh century by James the Deacon. 
we will be listening to its successor. The choir begins with one of the shortest but most beautiful motets by Thomas Tallis, O Nata Lux De Lumine. One night in 1829, a maniac, Jonathan Martin, set fire to the choir stalls and the organ, which had stood there for two centuries. The stone screen, however, escaped, and after much argument, was allowed to remain, and thank goodness for that, and a new organ was put on it. Its pretty pinnacled case is the one you see today as you come in to the nave of the minster. When you get into the choir, you can see how it matches the dark wood of the pinnacled stalls below it. This organ was last rebuilt about five years ago by Walkers, and on it, Francis Jackson now plays the introduction and fugue in A major by James Nares, who was organist here in the middle of the 18th century.
We now hear the choir and organ together in pieces from this century's Minster musicians. First, Sir Edward Bairstow, who was here for many years and died in 1946. Here is the creed from his communion service in D major.
Dr. Francis Jackson, the present director of music, began his career as a chorister here under Bairstow. We now hear Jackson's anthem, Blow Ye the Trumpet in Zion.
Lastly, Francis Jackson plays Bach's Prelude and Fugue in G major.
that recorded programme, Britain's Cathedrals and Their Music, came from York Minster, where the choir was accompanied by the assistant organist Ronald Perrin and conducted by the organist and master of the music, Francis Jackson. It was introduced by John Betjeman, who also introduces next week's programme from Exeter Cathedral.